Hi everyone, uh, Sam Bolton here. About to head into work. I wanted to do a quick video about the Pope. That's right, the Pope. Not Pope Francis in particular, just really the office of the Pope. Uh, one misunderstanding I see a lot about the Pope, uh, people outside the church and some people inside the church, is that when we say as Catholics we believe the Pope is infallible, we mean that everything that comes out of the mouth of any man who's in the office of the Pope is equivalent to words out of the mouth of God. And that's not what we believe. <laughs> that is not what the church teaches. Uh, papal infallibility means that when the Pope speaks from his seat uh, authoritatively, or when the term in Latin is ex cathedra, or from the seat of Peter, uh, about matters of divine dogma or doctrine, then those teachings are binding on the conscience of believers, Catholics. Um, if the Pope were to comment in an interview on an airplane about a political matter or a political or a politician or about which stocks are good to buy or about uh, the best uh, professional sport as far as entertainment value, those things are not uh, infallible. Uh, and it also doesn't mean that the Pope is perfect. I mean, the Pope is a man and can err and is subject to human failing like any other man. Um, there's a difference between infallibility from the seat of Peter when he's speaking authoritatively on issues of uh, morals and faith and uh, impeccability, which means that he would be perfect. Pope is infallible when he teaches from the seat of Peter, not impeccable. Now, there is scriptural precedence for this that we point to. Uh, in Matthew 23, the Gospel of St. Matthew, Jesus is talking about the scribes and the Pharisees. Now, if some of you have read the Gospels before, you'll know that Jesus was no fan of the scribes and Pharisees. He criticized them much, uh, often, and used very strong language against them. But here he says to uh, the multitudes in the Douay Rames again, chapter 23, verses uh, 1 through... Three. Let's uh, look at that. Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and said to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees have sitten on the chair of Moses. All things, therefore, whatsoever they shall say to you, observe and do. But according to their works, do ye not. For they say and do not. Uh, they, have a, they had authority because they taught from the chair of Moses, which was the proto-chair of Peter in the Israelite temple worship. Uh, so Jesus recognized that the scribes and the Pharisees were flawed and, and were very hypocritical. He called them whitewashed tombs, but he still recognized they had authority and even told his apostles and the multitudes to listen to them when they taught from the chair of Peter. Even though when they left and went about their daily lives, they may not have followed even their own teaching. And certainly there have been some prelates and are today some prelates who do the same thing, who teach things that are true and dogmatically correct and then go off and live hypocritical lives, hypocritical lives. That does not destroy their God-given authority, just as it didn't here. Jesus recognizes it. Uh, and within the church, I, I recently learned a term, and I'm still learning exactly what it means. It's called ultra-Montanism. From what I understand, Montanism is, uh, I guess, putting the, putting the Pope on a high level of respect and regard and looking to him as a source of authority, which is a good thing. Ultramontanism is taking it too far, right? Uh, and starting to think that whatever the Pope says and does is, uh, should be regarded with uh, reverence, even if it seems to go against church teaching, which obviously is too far. You know, uh, like I said earlier, the Pope is not impeccable. He's infallible when he teaches from the chair of Peter. So, uh, listen to the Pope as your spiritual authority when he's teaching on issues of divine uh, dogma, on issues of faith and morals. You don't have to listen to the Pope. I mean, you can agree with him, but you don't have to when he's talking about his personal opinions on things that don't have to do with faith and morals. So don't take it too far. Don't be an ultramontanist, but don't take it too far the other way and completely reject everything he says. The Pope is God's instituted uh, leader of the church and the head of the church authority on the earth until he returns. He's like the steward of the throne of Gondor in the Lord of the Rings story. I made this uh, comparison in one of my YouTube videos. Uh, in the Lord of the Rings story, 
the king of Gondor uh, and the line of the king had been missing for a long time, but there was a family that uh, took care of the throne until the, the king returned. He was not the king, but he exercised kingly duties. And that's what Denethor was. Now, Denethor was a bad steward, and he ended up going insane and killing himself in the story. <laughs> but that did not mean he wasn't the steward. He still had the authority until the king returned. Uh, so, so it is with the Pope, good or bad, he has the authority until Jesus Christ returns. And there is precedence for this in the Old Testament as well. Uh, I don't have the scripture passage in front of me. I'll post it in the comments. But there is passages in the Old Testament talking about the Davidic king, which Jesus is the fulfillment of. He's the ultimate Davidic king of the universe, uh, that he gave his authority to a, to a kind of steward. Uh, he gave, and they use the exact same language that he uses in Matthew 16 when he's giving over the keys of the kingdom to Peter. So the Davidic kings gave the keys of the Israelite kingdom over to their stewards of their kingdom. So I'll post that in the comments. But there's a, liter a, literary, press a literary analogy here and also an Old Testament scriptural uh, precedence to support this. So I uh, hope I'm clear. The Pope is not perfect, and not everything that comes out of his mouth is as the word of God. But he is authoritative when he teaches from his seat, the seat of Peter. Uh, and his teachings on dogma having to do with faith and morals are binding on your conscience as a believing Catholic. Uh, but don't take it too far. Okay, until next time. Bye.